So thanks everyone for joining Sake 101 presented by the MIT Alumni Club of Boston. My name is Kevin McCumber. I run food and beverage, mostly beverage events for the Club of Boston. And now since we've gone virtually for all MIT alumni, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening. I'd like to thank a number of folks who helped make this possible. First, the MIT Club of Boston for continuing to support these events, as well as the MIT Alumni Association and other MIT alumni clubs across the country for helping to get the word out. I'd also like to thank Todd Bellamy, our presenter for the evening. Todd is a fixture in the United States sake scene and uh, was instrumental in making sure that we have a good program for you tonight, as well as a sampling kit through Tipsy Sake that Todd uh, did a lot of legwork to get set up. So thank you very much for that, Todd. And finally, I'd like to welcome all of you, our alumni and guests uh, who've continued to support these events as well as support the MIT COVID-19 response funds. Thank you for your generosity. I'm sure a number of you are getting a little sick of hearing me continually uh, asking folks to donate to those funds, but I know that we are making a very positive difference and it is being noticed and put to good use. So thank you. So just to, uh, Todd, I'm just gonna throw you on mute there for a sec, but all right. Uh, so just to give a quick agenda for the evening, I'm gonna do this brief introduction and then I'll hand it over to Todd for the presentation, uh, which will include the tasting of the three recommended sake for the evening as well as a curated Q&A that I'll be taking through the Q&A portal that I'll tell you about in a little bit. And then we'll move to breakouts. And if you're not familiar with breakouts, this is where we get in a group of five or six people in a virtual room to just chat, talk about life, talk about sake, whatever is of interest, uh, as if we were together in person. And of course, no good tasting is complete without an after party. So Todd has graciously agreed to stay after the conclusion of the event, after the breakouts, to chat with us. And we'll all be able to take ourselves off mute and ask Todd any remaining questions that we have and just talk about life and sake in general. Yes, this event is being recorded and it will be made publicly available on the MIT Club of Boston's YouTube channel. I'll be sending out the link to that next week once we have that video ready. And I also would like to remind you that this event is free to attend. And I ask that you please join me in supporting MIT's COVID-19 response funds, uh, because I think MIT is doing a lot of great work to address the many, many uh, negative effects of the pandemic. If you'd like to ask a question of Todd tonight, I ask that you please go out to meet.ps slash MIT sake. You'll be able to answer, sorry, ask your question there. And then you'll also be able to see questions that others have asked and you'll be able to upvote those questions. I'll then just take the questions that get the most votes and pose those to Todd along the way, as well as at the end, if there are remaining questions during the curated Q&A section. We ask that you please refrain from posting questions for Todd in the chat. Uh, he will not be able to see them. And as you can imagine with several hundred people on the event, it gets a little bit unruly to try to manage that. So I ask that you please do use the portal. I know it can be a little challenging, especially if you're on mobile, um, but it, it's what we found is the best practice to try to manage uh, questions from a group this size. So thank you for that. You may know that this event is one in an ongoing series of food and beverage events uh, that we put on through the MIT Club of Boston. I'd like to highlight a few in our roadmap of future events. Next month, April 30th on Kentucky Derby Day, We'll be having an event all about North American whiskey with our friend, Nick Taylor, who is the co-founder of Taylor & Taylor Whiskey Company. Nick will be highlighting the similarities and differences between whiskeys from the United States and Canada and talking about the intertwined histories between these two genres of whiskey. We have a number of other events lined up after that. And I'd ask that you please consider filling out the post-event survey that will come in that email next week. I do get a lot of the ideas for our events from that email. So thanks for filling that out. If you'd like to make sure that you don't miss future food and beverage events, I'd ask that you join my food and beverage email list. I'll send the link for that in the post-event email. And also join the MIT Alumni Fine Spirit Society group on Facebook. I'll send the link for that too. And that's just a good way for us all to stay in touch between these events. I sometimes run some polls out there and we just get into very interesting discussions about uh, fine spirits and all things gastronomic. 
All right, it is my pleasure now to introduce Todd Bellamy, our speaker for tonight. Todd is the founder of Farthest Star Sake, which is a new sake brewery being set up right now in Medfield, Massachusetts, just south of Boston. He was previously the founder of Dovetail Sake in my hometown, Waltham, Massachusetts, and he even studied sake in Japan from the masters. It is really a pleasure, Todd, to have you with us here tonight. Um, and I'll stop there and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, <clears throat> thumbs up works. Yeah, <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I'm pretty excited uh, to be doing uh, your sake presentation tonight. Also, uh, you know, through Tipsy, we got some really amazing and more importantly, fresh sake, uh, which is hard in some uh, markets. So, um, I remember Kevin sent out an email that says that everybody should just pull all their sake from the fridge in the beginning. Uh, that way I've ordered them so that they're the correct temps when we end up tasting them. So pretty convenient. Uh, I will go ahead <clears throat> and share my screen so you guys can see. Boom. Okay. All right, everybody. I assume my presentation is on screen. All right. So we've got to. Awesome. Thank you very much. So uh, as Kevin said, uh, my name is Todd Bellamy. I actually uh, used to live in Japan um, for about four years and then came back to the United States and ended up working in the craft beer industry. Uh, so I worked in the craft beer industry for eight years. Uh, but during that time, um, I kept missing uh, really good sake uh, and was brewing sake at home and doing some sake related projects uh, with friends breweries in the area. And then eventually just was like, this is what I should be doing. I should be brewing sake. So uh, we are building a sake brewery right now. Uh, I was hoping when we set this whole thing up in October uh, to be standing in a brewery, but uh, so far we don't have that sort of thing. So uh, it's just a giant warehouse. We're having a couple of roadblocks with the building department, which should be cleared up pretty soon. But um, I will be the only sake brewery in Taproom in New England. Uh, the other closest breweries to you are Brooklyn and Toronto. So uh, we'll be the only game in town and we're just gonna focus on New England um, because that's kind of the game of sake in Japan, right? Focus on local products uh, and uh, have sake not travel as far. Uh, so that's me. Uh, all right, so yeah, so sake is a pretty interesting beverage for a lot of people. I think uh, sake is discoverable for a lot of folks. Uh, a lot of people who come across sake are sort of uh, discovering it for the first time. They're turning on their friends to sake. Um, and so this picture here, I always put up with my presentations because it's kind of what everyone thinks about as sake, right? Crystal clear in a nice glass, really nice bottle. Um, and so one of the sort of barriers to understanding sake for a lot of people uh, in the West is that um, you can't really tell anything about the beverage when it looks like this. So that could be water, that could be flat Sprite, uh, that could be anything, you know, as opposed to a beer where if you serve someone a beer that's black with a big thick head on it, they're already going to kind of have preconceived notions about what that beer is going to taste like or feel like in their mouth. Uh, sake is kind of a mysterious beverage for a lot of people. So uh, hopefully after tonight, we can get everyone a little more educated uh, just in time to open our brewery this summer. Uh, and you'll, you'll kind of get to see how complex uh, this can go. All right. Um, <clears throat> so as I, I actually had this sake later in the, in the presentation, but I've moved it up because uh, I just want everyone to have kind of a vague understanding of sake as we drink them throughout the night. So sake are uh, kind of graded on a scale from sweet to dry. Uh, the scale is called Nihon Shudo, which literally means sake degrees. Um, you might also see it referred to as sake meter value in English, uh, but that's a term I don't tend to use. So Nihon Shudo um, is based on an old uh, gravity scale compared to water. 
Uh, so zero, which is marked here on the scale as neutral, is the density of water. And then as the sake becomes more dense, it becomes heavier than water. So you are moving into the negative numbers. So any negative number is heavier than water because it has sugar in it, thus it's sweeter. And then the same as you move lighter than water, you're moving into the plus numbers. These numbers are lighter, which means they have more ethanol and less sugar. So they are by definition drier. So that's how sake are marked, uh, no matter if it's a US produced sake or Japanese sake, they're all marked on this same scale. Uh, so we will come back to this obviously as the night goes on and we drink a few sake. Um, and then this is a very complicated chart <laughs> just to show you uh, how complicated things can get in Japan. Um, so the metric on the left is acid levels. So the kind of higher an acid of a beverage, the kind of richer and heavier the beverage is. And then the dryness scale that we just discussed is on the bottom. So negative numbers this way, positive numbers this way, which are drier. So dry and lower on the acid scale tends to be kind of dry and clean. And then dry and higher on the acid scale tends to be like dry but rich. And then heavier, heavier on the acid but Sweeter is kind of more like aged sake, like a rich and sweet. And then this moves into the kind of drier, but still sweet. Uh, and so you're dealing with a sake that is kind of sweeter, but not as rich, like cleaner. So it gets very complicated. The Japanese like to overly uh, metric everything and graph everything out. <clears throat> so we're just gonna deal with this today. Uh, Negative numbers are sweeter, positive numbers, or plus numbers, sorry, are drier. So keep that in mind when we start tasting some brews. Um, also, when you're tasting a sake, um, there is no wrong answer. So if you taste something that your partner doesn't taste or I don't say, you know, oh, I really got some cherry or apple in there, uh, that's all about sensory analysis and everybody is very, 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 fine-tuned uh, individually. So some people might be able to pick up on things like rose petal, uh, which is a chemical called geranerol, or banana, which is isoamyl acetate, like all of these chemical compounds. Some people are actually blind to them. <clears throat> I'm actually blind uh, to diacetyl uh, in the nose, so I can't smell diacetyl, which is butter. Uh, so if I get a buttery beer or buttery sake with a lot of diac, I can't smell. Uh, so keep in mind, there's a wide range of sort of fruity and earthy and, and nutty and grainy, but you know, your experience of the sake is really the most important for you. And there's, there's no wrong answer. All right. Uh, everyone knows sake is this, but this is modern sake. So, um, sake actually started out, uh, a couple thousand years ago in Japan. Um, as a beverage called kuchikami no sake. Kuchikami means to chew something in your mouth. And so much like some other earlier alcohols from around the world, uh, sake was <laughs> first developed by chewing grains and nuts in your mouth and spitting it into a communal vessel. Uh, often in a village, uh, many, many people, uh, often women, would sit around a central vat and chew rice uh, millet, chestnuts, um, things like that, acorns, uh, and they would spit them into a communal vat. Uh, so I actually did this project a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> so on the left, that's everything that I've chewed and spit. And then after two weeks or so, wild yeast in the air allowed this to ferment. Uh, so I made sort of Stone Age sake. Uh, and in Japanese history, at, when the Japanese were doing this, uh, Japan was a pre-rice culture, so it was millet, buckwheat, acorns, chestnuts of what we found archaeological evidence of. Uh, and then later on, when rice was introduced to Japan, uh, they quickly found out that rice actually held up to this technology really, really well. So they started chewing the rice, spitting it. Um, I kind of did a hybrid of the two models. This is actually brown rice and roasted chestnuts. Uh, 
uh, and it fermented to about seven and a half percent alcohol and was quite sour because of lacto uh, bacillus bacteria and stuff that also grew in there well, with no control. Uh, so it was pretty sour and but definitely alcoholic and definitely drinkable, although you'd have to take my word for it because no one else would try. So uh, the wife wasn't really keen to drink spit sake <clears throat> and none of my friends would do it either. So uh, yeah. So that's sort of sake's humble origins. Uh, and then as technology got better and better and better, uh, which we'll go into in a bit, um, sake was refined even more and more. And unlike some areas of human expression where people tend to sort of romanticize the old way of doing things like it was better and the new way is not as good, Every sake brewer in Japan will readily tell you that right now we're making the best sake that's ever existed in the world. So, uh, yeah, pretty humble origins, but uh, it gets pretty high tech these days. All right. So what the heck is sake made out of? Um, <clears throat> everyone knows rice, of course. Uh, rice to make sake is a very specific uh, kind of rice. There's about 170 varieties of sake specific rice that are grown currently in Japan. And there are uh, two of those strains are grown in, in North America, one in uh, Arkansas, one in California. Uh, and so this rice that's on the screen now is actually eating rice. And I wanted to, you to see the, the big difference in some of the challenges to sake brewing rice. And the reason that sake brewing rice is really expensive uh, that makes sake expensive. So this is a pretty typical strain of eating rice. And you can see how the plants are kind of growing straight up and they're just staying that way. You know, some of the, the heavier fronds with rice are bending over, but the plant is generally straight, which means you can add a lot of plants into a plot of land and you can maximize your yield. Uh, but sake rice actually stays on the plant for longer and the plants tend to grow very tall and bend over uh, from the weight. Uh, and so this is Yamada Nishiki, which is, whoop, Sorry about that. This is Yamada Nishiki, which is the uh, sort of king of all sake rices in Japan, uh, number one for acreage grown without a doubt. And the plants are actually twice as tall as eating rice. So they bend way over, which means you have to allot extra space in the field to account for that bend over. So um, generally you get about 50% yield on Yamada Nishiki as compared to uh, regular eating rice, which obviously makes it more expensive for the farmer, more expensive for the mill guy, more expensive for the brewery, and that price trickles down to the drinker. So sake is more expensive um, than your average uh, grain-based beverage because the rice is so specialized and it takes a long time to make. Um, so one of the, the pretty much the thing that makes sake brewing rice uh, very different than eating rice is really easy to see in this photo. So in the middle of every grain, you get this opaque white heart, which is actually called the shimpaku, which means white heart. Uh, and so you get this opaque white heart. And what that is, is pure starch. Um, outside of that, there are little bits of starch, but it's, uh, increasing levels of proteins and fats. And so you want the starch because starch can be converted into sugar. The protein and fat kind of gets in your way during fermentation. So uh, the Japanese have developed uh, some pretty specific milling methods uh, that will take a grain of rice like this guy right here with this nice white heart and starts to slowly mill away the outside further and further so that eventually you can get your pile of rice to be a much higher percentage of pure starch, which theoretically makes the sake cleaner and more high quality. Um, the milling technology does take a very long time, which also adds to the cost. So the lower you mill it, the more sort of high grade the sake is and the more expensive it is. Um, so rice milling is uh, done in a separate building from the brewery. Uh, so that you don't get the rice dust all over everything and it doesn't infect your brew. <clears throat> so they use uh, this kind of fairly high-tech uh, cyclonic mill system. Uh, so this 
circulation chamber up here is very tall. It's usually about four or five stories tall. Uh, and the rice is in there and the rice will fall down into this bottom chamber uh, where this millstone is. And this millstone is a pretty uh, unique millstone. It's an hourglass shape, uh, which creates kind of a cyclone of suction in the bottom. And what happens is the rice falls down this long hopper in there and just gets nicked by the millstone and then gets vacuumed up to the top to fall down again and do that whole process all over again. Uh, and so it takes days to mill the rice down to the level that you want. And the further down you go, it's kind of a law of diminishing returns. So if it takes, um, you know, if it takes, uh, you know, two days to get to 60%, which means 40% has been milled away, uh, then it might take an additional two days just to knock it down another 10%. So it doesn't, it's not an equal amount of time. The further down you go, the slower you have to go so you don't build up a lot of heat, which cracks the rice and really affects brewing later on. So uh, there are whole buildings in Japan filled with these mills. Uh, every brew, you know, a lot of breweries will have their own mill. Some people buy milled rice. Uh, unfortunately, in the US, uh, there are three rice mills in the whole country. Uh, and so I um, can only buy my rice from basically three mills, uh, and that's it. So there are other rice mills for, you know, Uncle Ben's and other kinds of rice, but for sake rice, there's only three in the entire country, uh, two in California and one in Minneapolis. Um, so here's a great example of the real sort of change. The rice on the right is patty rice straight out of the farm. And then the next rice is 70% milled, which means 30% has been milled away. Uh, and then the rice on the left is 50%. And you can see it's a lot smaller than, than its original uh, size. And that allows you to just brew a much finer brew. All right, we're going to crack our first sake because I'm not one for waiting. Uh, so we're actually first going to, since we've been talking about rice and we'll continue to do so, uh, we're going to crack this uh, Tozai. Snow Maiden. Uh, this is an unfiltered cloudy sake. Uh, so you gotta agitate the bottle a bit. Uh, it's not carbonated, so don't worry about it, but definitely get that shook up. Uh, one of my friends one time uh, called me late at night and was like, we're drinking sake at a sushi place and I keep ordering unfiltered sake and uh, they keep bringing me like half things of sake, but he was decanting the clear sake off the cloudy sake and not drinking the cloudy part. <laughs> so if you get a cloudy sake, always agitate the sake before you open it. Uh, this is uh, a great sake. It's um, actually from a brewery uh, in Kyoto, so the central, so south central Japan. Uh, here's their brewery right here. Um, Kizakura Brewery, it's called. Uh, they've been around for a bunch of years and um, Tozai is actually a line of sake that they make for the export market. So um, they don't seem to sell Tozai in Japan, but um, it's generally an export sake and it's really, really good. Uh, Kyoto has uh, some really good uh, history with sake making. Uh, so yeah, let's everybody open this thing. I always smell the air inside the bottle because that's my one chance to smell the brewery um, <laughs> and then it's gone. Uh, so I know Kevin had mentioned uh, glassware in his email. Uh, there is no wrong glassware to drink sake out of. Uh, later on, we'll do a little deeper dive on uh, glassware and stuff. Uh, but um, definitely I recommend uh, Un, you know, white cloudy sakes tend to kill your glass really quickly because the white particles adhere to the sides of the glass. So uh, I actually have two glasses, one for the unfiltered and one for the filtered. Uh, so this sake is, would be considered rich and sweet. Uh, it is negative nine on our scale. So quite sweet, a uh, lot more heavy than water uh, and has sort of 1.6 1, 1. acid. So it's quite a middle of the road acid, a uh, little trending towards the high side. Uh, they actually make it out of two kinds of rice. 
uh, Gokyaku Mangoku, uh, which is in the top five for acreage in Japan, very popular rice, uh, which tends to, I think for me, present very ricey. Uh, and then uh, they use something called uh, Ginoumi. Uh, Ginoumi is uh, just a sort of Kyoto area rice. Uh, anyways, so. Hmm. So remember, there's no wrong answer, uh, but I'll tell you kind of how I taste sake. Uh, <clears throat> pretty fruity in the nose and um, uh, and a little bit ricey. And, you know, I get a lot of kind of juicy fruit, apple, peach, pear, that kind of thing. Um, hmm. I don't get a lot of spice. Um, but yeah, very fruity, uh, really clean. Finish is really clean, which I love, and has a little bit of a, like an acid pop at the end, which I really appreciate. Uh, so a sake like this. Oh, sorry. Question on the mechanics there. Please. Uh, do you do you taste a sake like you would taste a wine? Nose. I do. Yes. Yeah. Can yep. you put your nose all the way into it? I noticed you aerated a little bit. Could you just yeah? Walk yeah, absolutely. Yeah, time? I'll walk you through that. No problem. Yeah. So uh so sorry. I sometimes I, it's you know 7 30 at night and I just want to drink glass socket. So uh yeah, definitely I would uh I would. So if I was trying a sake for the first time, uh hold on, let me get another glass here. Um if I was trying a sake for the first time, even uh Nigori sake or something, um I would put it into a glass like this, uh, way oversized for the sake in it. Uh, but I would put it into something like this that narrows at the top uh, to focus the aroma. I would definitely swirl it. And then, yeah, I'd get my nose right down in there, um, be able to kind of capture everything uh, that I can smell. Um, oh, somebody says change the view to speaker. Um, so yeah, I tend to put it in a big glass, a little bit of sake. This is just if I'm tasting it for the first time. This is not if I'm just hanging out, having a burger, or drinking sake. So um, I get my nose way down there, agitate it. And then I will take a few sips of sake. Uh, and there's this kind of technique that's pretty common in the sensory analysis world where you put some liquid in your mouth and then you can suck air uh, through the liquid. It kind of makes a bubbling sound. Uh, and that aerates the beverage and allows some aroma and flavor compounds to be released. Uh, also, you have a thing called retronasal tasting, where uh, things will evaporate from the liquid or vape, you know, vapors will go up the back of your nose, which can actually uh, be sensed as smells. So that's another form of tasting and the aerating thing kind of helps you. So. I don't do that every time I drink sake, but certainly when I'm drinking it for the first time and I really want to dive deep or I'm drinking my own sake and I have to be hypercritical uh, about how it's being brewed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's how I taste sake. Also, uh, don't forget appearance. Uh, you know, this is kind of, I guess, dumb from an appearance angle, but um, but yeah, definitely I, I tend to look at sake, uh, hold them up to different lights and stuff. Um, I actually have, uh, uh, kind of a brewer's cup. Um, so this is used in Japan for analysis. Uh, it's white porcelain and it has a bullseye of blue circles in the bottom. Uh, it's called a kiki choco, which is like a I don't know, sensory analysis cup. So uh, the, the reason for this is that um, when you look at a clear sake or you know a sort of clearish sake in a glass, depending on what color the room is that you're in, what kind of light you're using, are you using LEDs, tungsten light, candlelight, daylight, whatever, it's gonna change your, uh, your sort of perception of the color. So the Japanese use this, uh, so it's white and you can look down into the white cup so it minimizes uh, light in the area. Uh, and then the two blue circles are used to judge clarity. So how clear can you see them? Um, you know, do they, are they distorted or whatever? It, it makes it really easy for you to see like a little bit of cloudiness in the soccer. All right, enough about me, back to the presentation. Uh, we had another quick question here. It's kind sure. of relevant. Uh, a lot of folks asking just about how long these keep at room temperature, unopened and open and in the refrigerator, unopened and open keep. Sure, yeah. Um, I do not keep any sake at room temperature. 
uh, everything is in the fridge, uh, you are, uh, if you're doing that, you are maximizing the uh, shelf life of anything. Uh, and so uh, I keep all my sake in the fridge and then every sake has a specific kind of drinking temp. Uh, luckily, a website like Tipsy, where we got the sake, um, will have all the brewer recommended temperatures and stuff. Uh, and so if you're keeping your sake in the fridge, once it's opened, uh, if you're putting unopened sake in the fridge, uh, you've got a pretty long time. I mean, I've had sake that's months old and still tastes awesome. Uh, obviously, it does change a little bit because you've now introduced air into the bottle. So there's some oxidative browning and stuff. Uh, I've had open bottles of sake that have gone into the like year, year and a half range. Uh, and they tend to start to change color and become darker from the browning. Uh, but they're still drinkable. Uh, my only tip is if you've got a sake, uh, this does not, not for Nigori. Nigori, drink it now. Uh, you don't want a six month old Nigori or whatever, but if you have a filtered sake and it's been half open in the fridge for six months for some weird reason, um, then, uh, drink it a little warmer than the brewer recommends. So warm it up a tiny bit, uh, and drink it a little warmer and that will help some of those earthier flavors from oxidation kind of jive. Yeah. Um, and again, the sake temperatures, uh, you know, like on Tipsy's website, uh, you know, they have this metric, uh, which corresponds to some traditional brewing temps. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what the brewer recommends. But, you know, I've had sakes where brewers think you should drink it cold and I thought it was better at room temp. Uh, so for something room temp, you would just take it out of the fridge while you're prepping dinner and then it warms up on the counter, right? Um, and then for anything warmer than that, uh, you would immerse the bottle or some kind of vessel in, war in a, a pan of boiled water. So you boil water in a pan. Uh, that's where uh, these guys come in handy. So everyone's seen like a sake set, right? They sell them everywhere of varying qualities. Uh, so this is what this is designed for, right? Small, heavy earthenware cup that can hold temperature. And then uh, this vessel, which has a very small mouth, which also helps hold temperature. And then you would put sake in here and then put this, you know, halfway or whatever uh, in a pan of boiling water and stick a thermometer in the mouth of it. And so, uh, you know, I'd like to tell you that I use this like, fancy Japanese like sake thermometer and stuff. Uh, but I don't, I use a digital instant read thermopen thermometer. Uh, and I stick it in the mouth of the thing. And then when it gets to the temperature I want, I pull it and start drinking. Uh, so that's what you do with warm sake or, you know, very old sake. Yeah. All right. There are Back also to the a number of folks yeah. asking oh. why no warm sake options tonight while you're on the job. Yeah, you know, uh, if we were in Japan, this would be a very different conversation, um, <clears throat> but uh, a couple of reasons. One, it's kind of spring today. It's like it was almost 70 degrees, it's been a little windy and stuff, but uh, it's getting to be warmer weather outside. Uh, also, unlike Japan, where uh, sakes are released specifically to be consumed warm, uh, in America, it is very hard to find reliably good quality sakes that are designed to be warmed up. So it's an esoteric thing. Generally in the United States, um, warm sake tends to be cheap sake, like really cheap sake. So I didn't want to kind of go down that road with like a cool sake 101 tasting. So we're drinking all high quality sake. So in America, the high quality stuff we get is all going to be wanting to be consumed room temp and colder. Uh, very occasionally you run across some sake that are great um, and recommended by the brewers in Japan to be warmed up. And so uh, I know on Tipsy, I think you can search for that kind of sake uh, using some filters and some other websites you can do the same thing. Uh, so if you run across a sake, you warm it up. Yeah, sure, warm it up. Um, hot water works uh, in Japan. It, excuse me, in Japan, there's actually a warm sake button on the microwave. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, no, no popcorn button, but they have a warm sake button. Um, so uh, you could do that as well. Uh, the first time I had warm sake in Japan was out of a microwave in a coffee cup. 
So, uh, you know, and I'll never forget it. So don't stand on ceremony. But yeah, so in America, generally warm sake is cheap sake, unless you're going to someplace that's really ordering the, you know, creme de la creme. And just as a reminder, I think you were asking folks to take the Kambara Bride of the Fox out of the refrigerator and have- Absolutely, I took all three out of the fridge. Yep, I took all three out of the fridge and, uh, you know, we'll drink, we drink, we're drinking the Nigordi now, which you want to consume cold. Actually, uh, Nigordi a lot, I consume on the rocks as well. So this, this Nigordi specifically, uh, I would definitely drink this on the rocks uh, if it was a, you know, different thing. Um, but it's good cold and it's good on the rocks. And then the Dasai, uh, you know, room temperature to cool. So by the time we get to it in the presentation, it's gonna be perfect because you pulled it out of the fridge already. And then the Kambada is actually the one you wanna drink sort of the warmest. And so um, that will be out of the fridge the longest. And that's how I've designed this talk. Very good. Thanks for taking all those questions, Todd. We're yeah, now you know how the sausage is made. All right. All right, here we go. Uh, Tozai, can you see my presentation? Somebody? Yep. All right. <clears throat> All right. I can only see two other speakers and it's cracking me up. All right. So Tozai in Kyoto, uh, Kizakuro Brewery, really great brewery, a little modern inside, and they have some like cool, like a whole wall of sake and stuff. Uh, Tozai brand. Uh, however, Kizakuda, as a little aside and to lighten up this talk, um, they are really well known for a series of commercials that started in the 60s that featured uh, this water sprite or sort of creature called a kappa. Uh, so I thought while we're just sipping a couple of sips of Nigordi before I move on, uh, we'll experience a 1972 Kizakuda kappa commercial. Here we go. All right, so uh, there's a 1972 Kizakura Brewing commercial. Uh, was there sound on that, by the way? It did not come through. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't know why. Anyways, um, still pretty funny. Uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, we were talking about rice uh, in sake brewing um, and it having to be polished to sort of increase its uh, percentage of starch. Uh, and so during brewing, uh, the rice then has to be meticulously handled. So um, this is not my brewery. This is, some, this is a friend's brewery, but uh, the rice is washed in little, little sort of lots, like 10 kilo lots, uh, to wash off the powder from uh, rice milling. And then it is soaked in water to increase its uh, moisture content. Uh, and then that allows for the rice to be steamed. So sake rice is not boiled, it is steamed uh, by increasing its moisture content by soaking it in water uh, and then steaming it, you're actually making the water that's absorbed into the rice uh, kind of explode from the inside out. And that keeps, uh, sort of cook the rice from the inside out and that keeps the outside of the grain like in perfect condition. It doesn't crack open like a popcorn kernel or something. Uh, and that allows all separate grains. So you actually have cooked rice, but it's dry. It's really weird when you first handle it, but it's cooked rice, but it's dry and the inside is cooked, but each grain is hard and doesn't stick together. So uh, that's the process. It is in, there are uh, sake breweries, larger sake breweries that use uh, machines to do this, but you know most of the sake breweries in the world do it all by hand. Uh, so uh, this poor lady has to, um, cool the rice on a tray uh, before you put it into the tank because it's too hot and it'll kill the yeast. Uh, and so uh, everything is cooled down on trays. There are machines to cool things down as well. Uh, they're a little expensive to export from Japan, unfortunately. Uh, so we will be using kind of a similar method, uh, but helped out by a blower fan. Uh, so yeah, the uh, rice is um, 
wash by hand some places and with higher grade sakes, but a lot of places use this very common rice washer device. Uh, it's just run off of uh, water pressure in the building. And so it slams, it like sucks up the rice and slams it against the underside of this cap and then just, you know, circulates the rice with water. And you can see like it's getting very foamy. There's a lot of dust on that stuff. But when you're done, like after three to four minutes, the water is pretty clear and the rice is uh, no longer got stuff on the outside of it. All right. Uh, so that's rice. A lot, of, a lot of cool rice uh, varieties involved, a lot of milling technology. Uh, the other heavy hitter in sake, really the most important thing in sake is koji, uh, which gets a lot of airtime these days. Uh, everyone's interested in koji from a food angle, from a, a brewing angle. So koji is a microorganism uh, called Aspergillus orizzi, uh, and it is in the Aspergillus strain, uh, although it's not bad for you like other Aspergilli. Uh, however, uh, it uh, acts as a catalyst to break the starches in the rice down into sugar, uh, which is uh, something your body does naturally, uh, but by using this secondary microorganism in the brew, uh, we're able to convert all that rice uh, into sugar. And that's what we need for fermentation. So uh, getting uh, cool photos of koji is real hard, uh, but I picked this photo specifically because it's like halfway through the growing stage and you can actually see the spots of koji starting to propagate on the outside of the rice. Um, whoops. Uh, and uh, eventually most of this rice will be covered in that sort of white powdery mold. Uh, it's a fungus, but uh, this is like halfway through the process. So I thought it was a good uh, sort of illustration of what actually happens. Uh, koji is the national microorganism of Japan. Uh, I don't know if we have a national <laughs> microorganism, uh, but uh, koji is the national microorganism in Japan. So uh, there's koji characters, koji TV. Uh, there's a TV show that features this koji character you can see on your screen. Um, uh, it's pretty funny. So koji is used uh, to make a variety of things. Sake, obviously, shochu, which is the distilled spirit. Uh, but koji is also used to make miso and soy sauce and other fermented beverages, pickles. Uh, so this is what koji actually looks like. Uh, under an electron microscope, uh, and um, it is basically a it's a fungus, so it's basically a plant, which uh, makes it easy to grow. So after you bring your rice into a special koji room, um, you uh, spread it out on large tables like this uh, to get it pretty thin, and then you inoculate it with. Um, Sorry, you inoculate it with koji spores, uh, which you shake over uh, the table. Uh, I've actually got a video for you. Um, so these guys, uh, you'll notice the air filters on the ceiling are turned off. Uh, so they've turned off all the air so that they don't create uh, wind patterns in the room because you're sprinkling microscopic spores. Uh, and then they very carefully, very deliberately uh, shake the spores out of a uh, jar, essentially. Uh, a lot of people tend to use the recycled jars from sake one cups, uh, which is also what I do. Uh, and then they put a little mesh over the end. So uh, they are just letting the spores float down and hopefully get as wide of a distribution as they can uh, so that they don't have any spots that weren't inoculated. Um, and when they get to the end, uh, they're almost done, but they tend to do one more pass much more rapidly to just get the last bits of koji spore uh, that are in the jar. Uh, occasionally, you might see some like dust or whatever fly out. Koji spores are microscopic. Uh, the dust that flies out of the little shaker jar is not koji. It's uh, like a protein from growing the koji, uh, but koji spores are microscopic, so you can't see them. Uh, all right. So you've inoculated your rice. Sorry, get off this guy. Why can't I? There we go. Uh, during the first day, it spends the time in that room, all balled up, letting the fungus grow. Uh, and then the second day, you kind of break up any clumps and move it into a deeper environment, like boxes like this. Uh, and then 
you are increasing the heat over a 48 day period, but also trying to dry the koji out at the same time. Um, this is one method to grow koji. There's a much older method, uh, which is I don't do because it's very labor intensive, uh, but you can see this row of boxes for this poor guy. These are all trays. And so if you're growing uh, three to 400 kilos of koji, you'll literally put a kilo and a half per tray and stack all the trays up. Uh, it separates all the koji and makes it so you can control temperature. But somebody uh, at the time, this poor guy, has to rotate these trays. So the one that's on the bottom right eventually has to find its way to the top left. So there are uh, people in breweries that will, during the koji growing process, that are just revolving hundreds of trays a couple times during the process. Uh, so cool and romantic, but we don't do that. Uh, here's this poor guy working in a koji room, uh, really sweaty. It's about 105 degrees Fahrenheit inside there. Um, but I am doing, uh, growing the koji in the exact same room that you saw the video earlier. Uh, and I've also worked in a couple other breweries. Uh, koji is the cornerstone of good sake. So whenever I go to a brewery, I always get some more koji experience, uh, because it is so vitally important. Uh, these people uh, at Kikasui Brewing actually, so you'll see up here, there's those trays that I was talking about. So they have that up there for higher grade sake, but then they'll use more of a box method or something a little more labor uh, efficient uh, for lower grade sake. It's still great sake, but uh, they reserve the trays for the real high, crazy quality stuff. Um, <clears throat> here's a brewery that I helped start in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so what we've done is hybridized both of those methods you saw. So we use a big flat table, but we can also insert uh, a wooden frame so that then we can thicken the bed of the koji uh, and um, help control the temperature uh, in the bed. And then, whoops, and then as we're growing it, we can actually remove the wooden frame or this end of the wooden frame moves to make the rice thicker. Uh, so we have a lot of control. So we've actually hybridized both of those Japanese methods. Uh, <clears throat> as a side note, this is uh, Jay Cooper. He's the brewer at uh, Sango Kuda, which is a ramen uh, sake brew pub in Delaware Water Gap, Pennsylvania. So if you're ever in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania and run across a sake brewery, uh, you know who I'm talking about. All right. So, uh, this is basically what happens during the koji brewing process. Uh, there are two types of koji for sake brewing. Um, Tsukihaze koji, which is on your left, and Nudihaze koji, which is on your right. Uh, and I thought if this is MIT alumni, we could get a, a tiny bit nerdy. So uh, basically what happens um, in the growing process, what you're trying to do is you're trying to propagate the koji on the outside of the rice grain but you're trying to dry the, the rice out as you're growing it. And the reason for that is that the genetic material to produce the enzymes that you need to break the rice down into sugar actually occurs in the mycelia and the hyphae of the fungus. So you want it to actually grow a lot of root structure and less surface material. So you keep the rice at a certain moisture level to get the fungus to propagate. And then as it grows, you increase the heat to dry this grain of rice out. And as it dries from the outside, uh, the, the water goes towards the middle and then the fungus has no chance, no choice, but to chase the water to the middle of the rice grain. And that makes more mycelia, uh, which creates more genetic material for you to create more enzymes, which makes your process more efficient. Uh, Nudihaze koji on the right, uh, it's not as sad as it looks. Um, so it's actually a totally valid type of koji, uh, but for uh, food production or some lower grades of sake in Japan, uh, they do a process where they don't control the moisture level as much. Uh, and so the koji propagates on the outside um, and uh, really just creates these like super hazy balls of you know fluffy rice. Uh, the, the only problem for that from a, a sake standpoint, you can make sake with it and it's fine, but you 
get less efficiency because uh, there hasn't been as much mycelia growth, uh, so you don't get as much enzymatic conversion, uh, but also some of the glucoamylase and stuff, the uh, enzymes that you want are used to fuel growth uh, for the plant because it's not chasing the water to the middle. So you end up with less efficient brew uh, and uh, ultimately not as good sake. So uh, those are the kind of things I think about uh, late at night. Uh, so anyways, uh, water is your next ingredient. We're drinking a beverage. It's got to have water in it. Uh, or it wouldn't be a liquid. So I have one slide on water because it's not that complicated of a topic. Uh, you'll see down the bottom left, uh, you need clean water and water that tastes good to drink. It's always a good start. And then iron and heavier metals like manganese are bad. They create off flavors in the sake. They change the color of the sake. They're really bad. And then minerals like calcium and sodium and potassium, uh, and stuff like that are really good because they fuel the health of the yeast. Uh, so that's all you need to know. Uh, generally, sake breweries are focused around uh, clean water sources in Japan. Uh, some of the breweries actually still have a well in the middle of the brewery, like right in the building, because uh, they built the brewery around. Um, we're almost to the second bottle. I saw a couple of people <laughs> say, sorry, almost there. Uh, and then your fourth ingredient for sake is uh, yeast. So the yeast we're talking about is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Kyokai. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the same kind of yeast used to make beer. Uh, so these uh, yeast are pretty uh, identical to beer yeast with a couple of exceptions. You can actually brew beer with sake yeast uh, and it comes out pretty good. Um, and so uh, sake yeast in Japan is tightly controlled by the Brewing Association. Uh, here are ampules of official Brewing Association yeast that you have to get from them. Uh, which makes it a little difficult in the States. Uh, and the big thing now with modern yeasts are foaming or not foaming. Uh, hold on just a second. All right, I'll backtrack, but let's drink the second bottle because I see a lot of chats down there. Uh, the second bottle we're going to consume is Dasai 45, which is an amazing sake. Uh, I'm going to get a clean glass. A little bit of a tricky closure. Um, has, <laughs> has a metal over cap, which holds in the sort of bar stop closure. Uh, you don't see that a lot in the United States because uh, we're not allowed to make some packaging with like sharp edges that have pieces that come off. Um, all right. I'm gonna pop this open. Smell the brewery. So we'll cover sake grades in a little bit, uh, but this is uh, Jumai Daiginja, which is the highest grade of sake there is. Uh, this brewery in Yamaguchi-ken, uh, southern Japan. Uh, here's the brewery right here. They've expanded, I think, twice since I was there. So <laughs> this is the picture you get. Uh, and it's based on a river in a tiny village. Uh, and here's the uh, previous owner. His son now runs it. But uh, Sakurai-san, really great guy. Uh, and so I did uh, some work at Dasai uh, a while ago in 2009. Uh, local newspaper covered me working there, uh, but great people, uh, amazing sake. Uh, they started out uh, saying, we're only going to make the highest grade sake, and we're only going to use Yamada Nishiki, which is the, the number one rice for making sake. Uh, they backtracked a little bit on the Yamada Nishiki because there's not enough acreage to go around. So, uh, but they still use mostly Yamada Nishiki. So, uh, this sake is very modern, uh, very clean. It's a plus three, which is trending to the dry side, but still has some sweetness to it. Um, so uh, we were just talking about yeast. Get off and suck it out for a second. Uh, so one of the things in modern yeast uh, development has been more and more ethyl capper weight, which is a chemical that is licorice or anise or white jelly beans, depending on who you are. Uh, so you get it right up front in the nose uh, and you definitely get it in the flavor. So this is actually, a, this sake is a blend of two yeasts. So it's a blend of a very uh, fruity common yeast uh, called number nine. And then this is uh, 1801 is the other yeast. And 1801 is that yeast, they literally just bred it for ethyl capper weight aroma, 
and a little bit of flavor. So this is a blend of those two. So I get a lot of anise in the nose and then um, hmm. yeah, really great. So kind of pineapple and mango, like kind of tropical fruit spectrum. And then a little bit of that licorice anise kind of uh, snap there. Um, I don't know who George Thomas is, but no, he did not provide the ATM. Uh, so uh, these guys are really great. I love their sake every time. Uh, they only make Jumai Daginjo, which is less than 50% mill. So every bit of rice they handle is at least milled down by half. Uh, so because of that, uh, you'll notice on the bottle, it says Dasai 45. That's the mill rate. And the mill rate is always what's left. Right, so you've milled away 55% of the rice. Um, don't worry, they don't throw it away. They use it, it goes to farmers, sort of candy companies, dog food, some other stuff. Uh, and so um, that's that 45. And then a lot of their styles, the bottle looks exactly the same, except instead of 35, it says 39 or 23 or whatever. Uh, and then when we get beyond 23, they actually make a sake called Dasai Beyond, uh, and they won't tell me the mill rate. So. Um, yeah, amazing sake, super clean, super modern. Um, when my brewery opens, uh, one of my flagship sake, one of two flagship sake is actually very close to this. It's kind of based on this model, uh, two yeasts, uh, really clean plus three, which is great. Um, yeah. So, uh, just want to tell you real quick about no foaming yeast while we're drinking this sake. Uh, no foaming yeast are uh, developed in Japan. Uh, one of the problems they were having is you could have a huge tank, but you could only brew, you only fill it up like halfway because it's all foam, uh, which cut down on yields and made it harder for brewers to, to live their lives. So uh, the Brewing Association and some other uh, prefectural labs started developing uh, no foaming yeast. Uh, and I apologize, I could not find an English slide for this, so I took a photo on my phone out of the book. So uh, you don't have to know Japanese for this, but obviously this is a tank of sake and has a ton of foam, which cuts down on the amount of sake you can actually derive from this tank. Uh, and so what happens is this big circle is a bubble of CO2. So when yeast eats sugar, it creates alcohol and carbon dioxide and a whole host of flavor and aroma compounds. So uh, what happens is, the bubbles of CO2 act as a nucleation site and all of the yeast cells crowd around it and are sucked up to the top by the rising CO2 bubble. Uh, so somehow they have determined a way to breed yeast strains that have a harder outer skin and reduces their lubricity uh, and it does not stick to the CO2 bubble. So the CO2 bubble goes through, it doesn't you know, pick up globs and globs of yeast and the yeast gets to stay in the liquid, which thus creates less foam. Uh, so that's how those were developed in Japan, pretty nerdy. Uh, luckily I've got like four or five yeast strains like that. Uh, really makes brewing a heck of a lot easier. Um, all right, so uh, the yeast in uh, sake brewing is where you derive a lot of your flavors and aromas. That's the same way for beer or wine or whatever. Um, in Japan, they tend to create a yeast starter in this little tank before they brew a large tank of sake. Uh, and uh, there's two kind of traditional yeast starters, Kimoto and Yamaha. What they do is they uh, go through this really exhaustive uh, long, month-long process. So they're growing their own lactic acid and then pitching the yeast. Uh, and then someone in 1920 said, hey, I got a jug of lactic acid on the shelf in the lab. Why can't we just dump that in? And then thus was created the Sokojo method, uh, which cuts the time down from a month to like 10 days. Uh, and you don't have to grow your own lactic acid. Uh, the Kimoto and Yamaha styles are some of my favorite. They tend to be earthier and funkier and, and that kind of thing. And then Sokojo is definitely this kind of sake, like Dasai. Clean, light, fruity. Um, this is what happens in a one month long yeast starter. Uh, I'm gonna blow through this because I'm really running long, short long on time rather. So uh, during the first half, uh, you are letting some uh, microorganisms grow and flourish, which actually reduces the environment for others. So when these two sort of spoilage organisms start to grow, wild yeast starts growing, 
which makes it inhospitable to these two, so they die. And then when the wild yeast gets to a peak, lactobacillus takes over, which creates a more acidic environment, which kills off all the wild yeast strains. And then when the mash is at uh, its uh, most acidic, you pitch the yeast. And uh, it turns out Saccharomyces cerevisiae brewing yeast loves acid. So it takes off and goes crazy. So by the end of this one month period, you've grown your own lactic acid, which is convenient. And then you've propagated a ton of yeast cells to make a nice batch of sake. Uh, it's usually done in a smaller tank like this guy um, and is done by hand and you have to control the temperature uh, every single day. Um, modern labs, however, uh, do a lot of different stuff. They run a lot of analysis. Uh, these poor ladies just run sake after sake after sake all day long. Uh, and you'll see every batch that they brew is on the wall. Every tank that's currently full has its own graph um, on this giant board. And they are constantly updating the graph with the current information. So uh, they drop out some samples so that everything is clear and it all tastes, uh, it all tests the same. Obviously, if you stuck this cloudy white sake into a machine to test its you know, alcohol, the cloudiness usually throws off the machine. So everything is filtered out first. Uh, and then this is the super complicated multi-axis uh, graph that they use to track every single batch. So sake has a deep tradition and a lot of hand making. Uh, but coupled with that is uh, some really kick-ass science. So uh, that's kind of why I like brewing. All right. Uh, the two ladies that were in that lab, uh, by the way, that's the lab of the sake you're currently drinking. Um, so uh, they test every day, titration for acid, moisture, percentage of the rice, glucose, amino levels, amylase, and gravity and alcohol for every tank in the entire brewery. So pretty crazy. Um, unfortunately, I have to do it myself. I like that they have all this like super high-tech lab gear, and then there's a teapot right here. In the corner, of the, in the corner of the lab, because uh, you know you get, need a little caffeine boost every now and again. Uh, all right, we're drinking some dasai. You know what? It is 8:04. Uh, judging on uh, our previous arranged schedule, uh, I think we should take a five-minute bio break. Everybody good with that? Uh, I'll pause right here on dasai, and uh, we'll just take a quick bio break for everybody. So be back in five. And we are back drinking some fantastic dasai 45. Hope everybody's loving it. Um, one of my favorite sake. All right. Oop, let's get on. Uh, um, I almost skip that. All right. So uh, real quick, how you build a batch of sake, because I'm a brewer, so I might as well talk about this. Uh, building a batch of sake uh, is pretty easy, actually. So um, you, you use 20 to 25% koji. That creates enough enzymes to break all the rice down into sugar, or at least most of the rice down into sugar. Uh, you know, that obviously gives you 75 to 80% rice. Uh, so you've got the koji rice, which we now refer to as just koji, and then the steamed rice. And then you're at about 130 to 140% water. So uh, if you use 100 kilograms of rice, then you're adding 140 liters of water uh, because one liter of water weighs exactly one kilogram. So the rice and water... Uh, uh, calculations are exactly the same. So that's kind of how we think about it as brewers, uh, the amount of rice times 1.4, um, you know, to give you the amount of water. So you kind of build it up like you would uh, like a sourdough starter in the beginning. Uh, so what you do is you add 25% of your ingredients uh, your rice, your koji, your water uh, on day one, and then all of the yeast or yeast starter that you've grown. Um, you'll notice it goes day one to day three. So there's a day in here called day two. It's called odori, which means to dance. Uh, and so all you're doing is giving uh, the thing in there, you know, the, the koji breaks the rice down into sugar. The yeast, each sugar makes alcohol, flavors, carbon dioxide. Uh, and so as that 25%, uh, you kind of want the yeast to really get ahead of steam. Uh, and then on day three, you add another 25%, which brings it up to 50% of the tank. Uh, and then on day four, you add 50%. So you're kind of giving the yeast a real running start uh, because it has to do all the heavy lifting. 
Uh, so that's how you build a tank. And then uh, you can, uh, it goes into kind of a deep open tank, uh, much like you'd see in a brewery. Um, coolant is wrapped around the outside of it so you can control the temp and then it has to be stirred by hand. Uh, so here's a small uh, tank in uh, San Francisco that you can see I'm just using like what looks like a boat oar. Uh, and, but if you get a much deeper tank at a larger brewery, you've got to use a long pole like this to really mix the, the stuff up as it ferments. Um, and so sake can go anywhere from, you can make sake in like 20 days, but the stuff like what we're drinking now, dasai goes 35 to 40 days of fermentation. Uh, and just to let you know, uh, this is a typical temperature gradient you'd see in a sake brewery. So this is degrees C, uh, and this is days. So, um, when you're first mixing in the rice, you kind of let the yeast, uh, get off to a running start, a little warmer, and then you're crashing it to cold, and then you're intentionally slowing down the yeast to give the koji time to create enzymes to start breaking the rice down into sugar. Uh, you kind of comes to a crescendo, and then you slowly start to ramp it down to sort of rein in the yeast at the same time. Uh, and then table sake is fermented at a shorter time at a hotter temp. So uh, this chart goes out to the same number of days, but a lot of times uh, for table sake or cheaper sakes, they'll ferment them up to 15-ish and it'll only go like 20 days and you're done because uh, they're just cranking that stuff up. Uh, so the two processes I was just talking about is really the key to awesome sake. So koji, uh, the one of microorganism, makes all the food. And then the yeast, the other microorganism, eats all the food and makes alcohol and carbon dioxide. So you have to balance these two processes in the tank. Uh, if your koji is really awesome and you have kind of crappy yeast, then the koji is going to outpace the yeast and create a whole tank full of food, which the microorganisms in the room are going to love, right? So and you never know, you know, what is going to come floating through the air and land in your giant tank of sugar. Uh, however, on the flip side, if your koji is not that great because you weren't that good at growing it and your yeast is really great because you bought it from a yeast lab, then the yeast is going to run out of sugar. It's going to outpace the koji. And when yeast runs out of sugar, uh, you get what's called autolysis, where yeast cells run out of food and they some of the cells die. Uh, and then the cells that are left alive eat their ruptured uh, friends who've died off. That's a little cannibalism, but that creates a lot of off flavors and undesirable stuff in your sake. So it's the balance of these two processes that make really great, great sake. Uh, now you've got this giant tank of one month old rice gruel that's alcoholic. What the heck do you do with it? So you got to really, you know, kind of a unique thing in the alcohol world, you got to press it out. So uh, the original way to press it out was to hang it in bags. Well, the original way in the modern era uh, is just to hang it in a bag and its own weight will kind of press out some. It's not clear. You can see it down the bottom of the tank. It's sort of whitish like the first socket we had. Uh, but uh, that is considered um, the highest quality socket because you're not – pushing on it with any pressure. Uh, it also has the lowest yield by far. Uh, so they tend to do this now for special sake or competition sake uh, because it's very costly to make because you don't get a lot of sake out of it and it's labor intensive. Uh, the next method would be uh, what's called a fune, which is actually just a character for boat in Japanese. Uh, it's basically a box press. So you've got this box here that has mesh on the sides and then you fill hundreds of bags uh, with your sake mesh in the bottom uh, and line them all up pretty like I did and then you press it out with hydraulics or weight and uh, it takes about a day to get all the sake out. Uh, it's more efficient than the drip but uh, not efficient compared to modern methods uh, and then uh, you can buy a specialized press uh, for modern breweries. Uh, and uh, yesterday I got a video uh, from my press manufacturer because my press is all built and ready to be shipped. So here's a video of a modern sake press uh, that would be more efficient uh, than the other two methods. Oh, whoops, for some reason, doesn't want to play my video. Uh, so yeah, 
Um, that's that's my sake press. Uh, it's a little scary how big it is, uh, but I'm certainly going to be able to make some great sake with it. Uh, it has a ton of different plates uh, that you force sake into under pressure, and then clear sake comes out. And then each side of the plate, one side is a filter, and the other side is an inflatable membrane. So when the sake stops flowing out, we can inject air into every one of those holes, which will inflate the membrane on every plate and create more internal pressing. So that's the membrane side. Uh, so that's a, what a modern brewery does, uh, which creates the highest yield. Uh, the Japanese don't consider it as fine of a sake because uh, you've used a lot of pressure to press it out, uh, but it has the highest yield and the sake still tastes pretty awesome. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to cover you guys real quick uh, is this ongoing debate uh, which makes me uh, laugh. So uh, there's a bunch of people who um, sell sake and talk about sake or like sake sommeliers and stuff uh, that um, do not like the word unfiltered for nigori sake. So this sake that we drank earlier that's white uh, is called nigori sake. Uh, nigori is a word in Japanese that just means uh, like muddied or, you know, full of sediment and so we don't really have a cool word like that in english so we tend to call this unfiltered uh the reason that some people have a problem with that is uh, i will draw you to the screen uh this is nigori sake uh which is white like we just had uh this sake on the right is unfiltered so uh i know it looks real clear but it's technically unfiltered sake because the japanese brewers separate this process from this process and they're also required to do so by law so they press out the sake which i guess you could consider some kind of select filtration you're taking out all the solids and leaving liquid behind um but uh that just means you took out the chunks of rice and stuff and so this sake is technically unfiltered so they have pressed it and then put it into a tank and cooled it down and then some of the heavier sediment has dropped out and then they've just pumped the sake off of the sediment. They didn't actually filter it in any way using a modern filter. So uh, these are both, uh, so the, the interesting debate is kind of drinker or salesperson versus brewer. So in the brewery, guess what? These are both unfiltered, right? We haven't filtered either of these. Uh, and so I think it's okay to call Nigori sake unfiltered sake uh, because it's more of a descriptive term. Uh, but uh, there is a little bit of a debate in the sake drinking world. Uh, so this is, if you ever see this term, muroka in Japanese, uh, muroka means unfiltered. So it means they haven't charcoal filtered it or applied any technology. Uh, all right, I'm just going to talk about type of sake real quick. Uh, Honjozo and Junmai are the two basic groups you got to know about. Honjozo is your our four ingredients, but at the end of the brewing process, they add a little distilled alcohol. Uh, a lot of people use kishasha, which is like a Brazilian sugarcane spirit, has no flavor, no color, no nothing. Uh, it temporarily raises the alcohol level. Uh, some people say that they, it allows them to trap alcohol soluble flavors and aromas that you would lose in pressing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's more of a modern style, but they're not fortifying it because they end up adding water back to make it like 15 or 16 percent uh, anyway. So they're not bumping up the alcohol. They're just doing so temporarily. Uh, and then Junmai are all the sake we're drinking tonight. Uh, junmai means pure rice. And so Junmai sakes are just our four ingredients, rice, koji, water, yeast. Uh, and those are basically the sort of two manufacturing methods. Uh, and then how people grade sake is the aforementioned sake milling uh, rate. Uh, and so Junmai sake, just Junmai, or in, and table sake has no specific minimum milling rate. Uh, they used to have one for Junmai, but they removed it a, couple, a bunch of years ago. Um, so this can be anything. And then as you mill the rice down, the sake becomes a finer and finer grade. 70% uh, minimum, which means 30% has been milled away, is for Honjozo, which is that alcohol added type of sake. Uh, some very good Honjozos out there. 
Um, it tends to round all the flavors off. You don't really get any flavor that jumps out of you or any aroma that jumps out of you. It kind of rounds it all off and makes it more of a, I don't know, broader appealing sake. So 70% minimum and then 60% minimum sake is called Ginjo grade. So uh, if you don't add any alcohol, it is a Junmai Ginjo. And then if you add alcohol, it's just a Ginjo. They don't say Honjozo generally. Uh, so 60% minimum. And then Dai Ginjo, which just means big Ginjo, is 50% uh, minimum. And then interestingly enough, they don't have any other classifications. So 50% and below is Dai Ginjo. It doesn't matter if you go all the way down. Uh, there's a brewery that, <laughs> there's a brewery owner that I met that makes a nine. So he polishes away 91% of the rice grain. Uh, I think at that point, you're just trying to prove something to other people. Uh, but 50% below is all considered Dai Ginjo. Um, the interesting thing is you don't have to use these in Japan if you don't want. Uh, so you could mill a rice down to 50% and call it Ginjo. Didn't sell it at a lower price point, uh, but the taxes are also derived on this system. So some breweries actually take a little bit of a hit and sell a sake at a lower uh, rate than it really is um, for various reasons. But yeah, the last sake we're going to taste tonight is the same as just that. Uh, so there's a lot of words out there. Uh, basically, uh, I tend to just, you know, Honjozo and Juma are the two types, and then all of these descriptive words, right? Kimoto, Genshu, which is undiluted sake. So there's a bunch of great books out there by some great educators on sake 101, like terminology and stuff. There's a lot of websites you can use. So generally what I tell people who know nothing about sake is just look for Juma. If it says Juma, it's going to be delicious. It's going to be a great sake, great quality. Uh, just look for this word if you don't know any other word. Junma means pure rice. It's a really traditional, delicious sake. And then, you know, as you drink more sake, you can geek out and learn all these different words and terms and, you know, uh, more complicated things. Uh, glassware we had kind of broke, <laughs> kind of talked about earlier, <clears throat> but um, there's a lot of sake glassware out there. There is no wrong glass to drink sake out of. Uh, I have switched uh, to this glass, uh, which is just kind of funky shape. It's actually nice to hold, uh, which is one of the reasons I like it. Um, and it's a great size. Uh, there's a lot of different glasses out there. So these are little can shaped glasses. You got sake sets. Uh, you also have to remember in Japan, nobody pours their own drink. So when your glass is empty, the people that you're hanging out with fill your glass. And so because of that tradition, Japanese sake cups tend to be very small. Uh, a lot of cups tend to be small because that way your friends are uh, filling your glass more often and it makes the whole sort of session and hang out uh, more fun and sort of giving. It's pretty cool. It's kind of a cool tradition, but that's one of the reasons that you see these smaller cups. Also, these sets, as I had mentioned before, generally designed for drinking hot, you know, warm sake. Um, oh, I'd already talked about these for sensory analysis. They're white, so the color is the same. Uh, so generally what you run into, I think, in my life is sort of a separation between the old and the new, right? So it depends what kind of person you are and how you want to experience the evening. But a sake set like this, uh, which is actually made by my friend Ryan, which is, it was nice. He kind of gave it to me when our brewery was going to open. Uh, so a sake set like this, great for warm sake, great if you want to share sake, you know, room temp sake that you're pouring for other people. Uh, and have kind of a nice evening. And then you have something very modern, right? This is a Riedel glass uh, from Germany and it comes in at the top and it's very fine glass and uh, they designed it specifically for sake. So you have this kind of split and it just depends on the person you are. Um, and there's no wrong answer. So currently these are kind of my go-to cups for drinking sake at home. Uh, this is a cool uh, little cup that my wife gave me for Christmas with owl on it. Uh, here is a can shaped glass that we're gonna use at the brewery tap room when it opens. Uh, this is actually a cup from a brewery that failed before they ever opened. And it just reminds me of that as a possibility. A uh, cup my friend made, free beer cup from Japan, and the steel cup I drink sake out of in the backyard so I don't break anything. Uh, all right. So yeah, and there's no wrong answer. Drink out of whenever you want. Um, and, you know, the sake is going to be just as great. All right. Uh, on to the third sake. Um, Our third sake is called Kambara. 
uh, the Bride of the Fox. It has to do with sort of the local uh, sort of legend in the area where they are in Niigata. Uh, Niigata is on the west coast of Japan, has more breweries than every other prefecture in Japan. Uh, Kambara is made at the Kayatsu Brewery, uh, which is this super picturesque in the mountains fog. I mean, I don't know if they couldn't have done a better picture, but uh, it's a super picturesque brewery. And it's actually run by this married couple uh, Dr. Sato and his wife, uh, Mrs. Sato, and they're really great people. Here's Mr. Sato. Here's Dr. Sato at my last brewery when I was brewing sake. Uh, he came by with a couple other brewers to visit. Um, and so uh, they both come from sake brewing families and they run the brewery together. Uh, and Mrs. Sato is actually uh, one of the foremost sort of sake entrepreneurs in a rapidly growing uh, female driven uh, brewery uh, scene in Japan. So more and more female breweries, uh, brewers and brewery owners are coming out and making really amazing sake. So uh, Mrs. Sato is one of the sort of foundations of that in the modern era. Uh, and she's a really cool lady. Uh, so yeah, they brew this sake. So much what I was talking about before, uh, this sake is called a Junmai Ginjo, which we now know is 60% milled rice and below. And Junmai, they didn't add any alcohol to it during fermentation. However, uh, the rice is milled down to 50%, which technically makes this a Daiginjo. But Dr. Sato really wants people to enjoy great sake all the time. And so they sell it as a Ginjo at a lower price point just so consumers can have access to it. Uh, all right. So this sake we're drinking sort of closer to room temp. Uh, it is a very different sake than the last one. Uh, and the reason that I included it uh, in our pack. Um, however, like the last sake is exactly the same dryness scale. So this is a plus three sake, just like the Dasai. And it's interesting to go back and forth between those two because uh, they're both plus three. Um, this is go hyaku mangoku rice, 100%, uh, which is common in Niigata, uh, where uh, most of the breweries in Japan reside, or a good chunk of them. And uh, so a much earthier sake, uh, ricey. Um, I'm trying to, like chestnutty, a um, little bit of earth, kind of moss. Uh, hmm. Oh man, that's good. Hold on. There's a lot going on in there. So uh, yeah, I actually get a little bit of pine, believe it or not. Uh, but um, there's definitely some fruit in there, but like ripe fruit, almost brown fruit, and then rice, um, and then some really interesting warm alcohol on the backside. Um, you know, some nuttiness in there, some graininess in there. So yeah, so as you've gone from these two sake, it's pretty interesting. Uh, they're very similar builds, 50% uh, rice mill, 45% rice mill. The previous one, just tropical fruit and spice and like everything just jumping out of you. And this sake, you know, almost like custardy and earthy and, you know, lactic and kind of round. And it's a very different sake. Uh, but made with, you know, very similar ingredients. And actually, their tech specs are very close. Uh, so pretty interesting. This one, uh, for you warm sake fans out there, uh, you could warm it up. I would go about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so, you know, this is a, um, you know, 16.5% ABV sake. So it just has to be a tiny bit above your body temp for it to be warming. Uh, so 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then uh, that's really where the sake, it's not that it's, you know, better now and worse and hot, but some sakes have two expressions like that. And the sake will drink a little different, but you can tell how earthy and creamy it is, uh, how that would kind of hold up to some warming. So yeah, all right. great job, Dr. Sato. All right, Todd, the number one question, I think on everyone's mind, we teased them a little yeah. bit just in the email. Why do you recommend not pairing sake with sushi? Yeah, so um, so the for me, uh, I don't really recommend pairing sake with sushi. And I have a lot of Japanese friends that also do not 
sushi, you know, like brewers and stuff who don't uh, eat the two together. It's not that it's weird. If you went to a sushi restaurant in Japan, uh, I'm sure they have a few sake. Um, but uh, for me, they kind of rely on the same playbook, which makes them less interesting food parents. So sushi is rice that's mixed with vinegar and sugar uh, to certain levels. And then it's got raw fish expressions on top of it. And so sake is the same thing. It's that balance of uh, lactic acidity and sugar that you leave in there outside fermentation and you're balancing sweetness and acidity to kind of make this rice-based expression. So for me, they're very similar, uh, which I don't find that exciting. And so in Japan, uh, when I live there, um, you know, generally when you're out drinking sake, it's at a small pub called an izakaya and all of their food tends to be grilled and deep fried and seasonal vegetables and pickles and that kind of thing. It's like Japanese pub food, but a lot of grilled meats and savorier dishes uh, and a lot of, you know, pickled stuff and like stuff to make the night interesting, you know, go from a grilled item to a pickled item to a, you know, a potato thing and then over to something and then always ending with rice. Uh, so I find food like that a lot more interesting. And so when I came back to the States, it's not like I can just pop out my front door in Natick and walk down to the yakitori place and get like grilled chicken on a skewer. So, um, you know, you start hunting for similar experiences and similar food that acts on similar pairings of, you know, uh, umami and, you know, sort of heavier grilled flavors and things like that. So for me uh, to have that same experience, but not be able to be in Japan, uh, I really like sake with tacos is probably my favorite pairing. Uh, tacos, anything I take off the grill, a burger or meat off the grill. Uh, my wife's vegetarian, so I do a lot of sort of miso slathered tofu off the grill, which is also a great pairing with sake. Uh, and then a lot of just fresh seasonal veggies, whether they're sauteed or pickled or, you know, put in a soup or whatever, depending on the year. So um, yeah, I like to kind of mix things like that uh, and tend to look for foods that are readily available here that fit that sort of niche in uh, my life so yeah if you've never had a, che a bacon cheeseburger with sake then you're missing it big time <laughs> uh, uh on a similar note people are asking about sake cocktails do you have any recommendations for yeah. that all right so uh here's my thing uh on sake cocktails so sake cocktails um the problem i have with most sake cocktail recipes that i've seen on the web um is they have sake plus other distilled spirits in there. So there's distilled spirits like vodka or gin or whatever, and cordials and all kinds of stuff with sake. You lose the sake almost immediately. So somebody who's making a sake drink that has five or six other alcoholic ingredients and then some sake in it, you're not going to detect the sake at all. So... Uh, for me, you can make some sake cocktails uh, that are that uh, rely on sake chiefly for the flavor and the alcohol. So sometimes during the summer, I'll buy like a big bottle of cheap sake because uh, you don't want to do this with very expensive sake, but uh, a big bottle of cheap sake and I'll put like four or five ounces in a glass, like a large glass and put a little bit of simple syrup in there and tonic water and ice and fresh lime and mint and almost make like a mojito like beverage, but it's got like five or six ounces of sake in it. So it's a good sized drink, uh, but you're not relying on any other alcohols because it all just covers the sake almost immediately. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. It looks like we have a few home brewers on as well and they're asking. Oh, know, bring it on, man. If you're, if you're a home brewer with a, a good amount of equipment to make your own, how difficult would it be to make good sake? It's not that bad. Uh, you need a bucket <laughs> or some kind of container. Uh, when I was home brewing, it was generally a brew bucket. Uh, then um, the biggest problem for the average home brewer is you're going to have to control the temperature uh, to a very finite degree. So uh, you're going to need some sort of dedicated digitally controlled refrigeration device. So the best thing to get is a top load uh, freezer and you hook it up to a temperature controller. And basically what the temperature controller does is reads the probe inside the sake and then whatever you tell the temperature to be, it 
reads the sake temp and then it turns the freezer on and off to maintain that temp. That's the best way to do it at home. So, but you'd need a dedicated piece of equipment like that. Uh, and then, yeah, it's pretty easy. You open the top of the freezer, take the lid off the sake, stir it, put the lid back on it and close the freezer and you're good to go. Uh, and then you'll need a little bit of DIY uh, equipment that you make uh, for pressing out the sake. Uh, I used to run an old sake blog called bostonsake.com. Uh, there's actually several videos on there about homebrewing sake, and there's a video specifically about how to make a DIY home style press for pressing out your sake. Uh, so if anybody's interested, check out bostonsake.com uh, for the press video. Uh, but yeah, once you press it out, then it's like any other thing you would do as a homebrewer right? Drop it out with cold and filter it or however advanced your homebrew is. Very cool. Um, yeah. Another question here, other than your brewery and Tipsy, where I lost you. are some good you places go? to get, where are some good places to get sake in the Boston area as well as outside the Boston area? Sake and like local sake, which is very different. But if you're looking to buy commercial sake, which is your only other option at the moment, uh, in the Boston area, I really recommend Reliable Market in Somerville. Uh, it's a family owned Korean Japanese market. And the son, Paul, uh, has really embraced uh, craft beer. He's like a younger guy, really cool guy. And so he's slowly converted like the whole middle of this Korean Japanese market into a giant craft beer, sake, wine store. Uh, and so um, they carry a lot of sake. They keep a lot of their sake in the fridge, which I highly recommend. Uh, and so, yeah, they are really great source. So reliable market in Somerville. Uh, there's also, if you're in Southie, there's a store called Social Wines, uh, which is, um, they don't have as much sake as reliable market, but what they do have moves very quickly and is um, fresh and they're knowledgeable so they can kind of guide you if you're lost. Uh, plus it's just a really awesome little alcohol store in Southie called Social Wines. So uh, great people, they have other stuff. Uh, so if I ever need anything like real difficult for like a cocktail, that's where I go. Uh, and then if you are out, um, in Metro West, away from Boston, uh, Dion's, which is a family-run liquor store since 1933. Uh, they have four locations. And uh, I actually used to work there while I was writing my business plan. So uh, I um, retooled their entire stocky selection, and they only carry like really small cups and cans, uh, which makes them fly off the shelf. And so the sake turns over quicker. Uh, so you have a good range of sake there, only in cups or cans, so you can try a lot of different kinds. So Dion's Liquors, there's two of them in Waltham, uh, one in Natick and one in Newton. Uh, so that's one of the best sake uh, sections you can get in Massachusetts. Because uh, it's every cup or can's a winner. They're all small formats. So you can grab and go. And none of them sit there for very long, so they're not beat up and, you know, crappy. That's my opinion. That's great. All right. uh, I think my, my connection dropped for a second. Did you talk at all about where to get sake uh, in other major areas or? Um, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't, you know, obviously I'm not gonna know about every Metro market in the United States, but uh, in New York, uh, there is um, a great uh, sake only retailer uh, called Sakaya. And so there are some of the major cities have sake only retailers, which is pretty rare in the United States. Uh, so the big ones are Sakaya in New York, uh, Sake Nomi in Seattle, which is kind of the OG of the group. Uh, and then True Sake in San Francisco. Uh, I, they're the only three that I know of that are specifically exist to sell sake and nothing else. So, um, if you're in those markets, definitely seek those places out. Very good. All yeah. Right. Thanks, Todd. Um, you're welcome. We're, we're coming up on the quarter to nine mark, which is where we try to go to the breakout rooms. Oh, so, yeah. Somebody just recommended Ambassador. Somebody recommended Ambassador Wines in New York. Also, Aster Wines in New York has a lot of sake, and they have two specific sake specialists on staff. So, yeah. Sorry, Kevin, didn't drink. No, no worries. Um, I was just going to say that, you know, we didn't get to all the questions, 
Um, hmm. But if you still have some for Todd, his email was in the pre-event email. I'll also include him on the post-event email. So if you have follow-up questions for Todd, you can feel free to reach out through um, that email to him. Todd, did you want to make any last uh, comment about your, your brewery? I know you might be looking for some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, real quick. Uh, sorry, I can talk for hours about sake. So uh, I was I was trying to make it so I didn't go long. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I just real quick, we are building a brewery in Medfield. Uh, just having a little hiccup with the building department, but we have our federal brewing license. Uh, this is not a real sign. It's just a really convincing mock-up by my graphics guy. Uh, I wish our sign could be that big, but this is the building that we're in. Uh, it's an industrial building in the middle of Medfield. Uh, no one's actually seen any of this stuff, but uh, I thought that this was such a cool talk. Uh, I would share this basically for the first time. Um, so these are some um, really high-tech point scans of our space, uh, of our architectural plan. And so you're going to come in the front door and it's going to be all tap room. Uh, the bar is actually inside of a shipping container. Uh, and then the only thing separating you and the brewery is a half wall, 45 inch tall half wall that has a drink rail at it. So you can actually sit here, drink sake and look straight into the brewery. Uh, we tried to remove all the barriers that we could uh, so that people could understand sake. Uh, if anybody's really interested, uh, here are the blueprints. Uh, so these are the, this is the front entrance door and the, and the exit door. Here's the bar, a couple of bathrooms. This is our Koji room for growing Koji. So we made it a butt up against the tap room so we can put a window and you can actually watch us grow Koji. Uh, check in on the Koji, uh, walk in, uh, gigantic bottling line uh, so we can bottle sake and sell it all over New England. Uh, pretty big press, uh, a bunch of tanks and some bric-a-brac. Uh, but yeah, this is our, our general design. So you can be in the tap room and you can just look straight down the middle into the brewery and see, you know, what we're doing and kind of see how sake is made. So for people like you who've gone through a talk like this, uh, it's not uh, as illuminating, but for people who are like, I have no idea what sake is and why there's only one brewery in New England. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. So hopefully everybody will uh, tune in to our channels. Uh, pay attention and come by when we open the brewery. Uh, if you need any information, you can go to farthestarsake.com. Uh, any IT people out there, I also bought farthestarsaki, S-A-K-I.com and redirected it to my website because a lot of people in America misspell sake. Uh, so you can go there. There are links to all of our social channels. Um, you know, hopefully you enjoyed tonight's talk and uh, want to hear what else I have to say. There's a blog section, all of our social media. Uh, we are still taking on a couple investors. So if anybody uh, loves the thought of local sake and wants to join us as an investor, uh, contact us through our website. Uh, there's an email link uh, and you could join our intrepid group uh, of sake investors. So uh, definitely uh, gonna be a fun time. And then I just wanted to say one quick shout out uh, to uh, Tipsy Sake. Uh, they really arranged for us to get some Primo Sake. Um, they're really great people. I don't own any of Tipsy or work with them or anything. Uh, it's just nice to be able to order specific sake for me. Uh, and being in, if you're in Massachusetts, which I know a lot of us are on this call, um, you get sake in a couple of weeks and it tends to be really fresh. So I don't know if anybody noticed, but the Kambada, the last sake we had was bottled November of 2020. Uh, the Dasai uh, is from uh, November 2020 and the Tozai cloudy sake that we had was December 2020, bottling date in Japan. So uh all the sake I get from them is like that. So uh, Sachko and I are friends and she works at Tipsy, uh, it's this lovely lady here. And uh, she has actually arranged for everybody on the call uh, to get 20 bucks off their first uh, box of sake, if you'd like. Uh, they have a subscription service. Uh, you get um, six bottles of this size, uh, four times a year, I believe. Uh, it's free shipping. Uh, and they curate the box for you and send it to your house with tasting cards and ideas about food and stuff. Um, so it's pretty cool. So you, you just have to go to uh, Tipsy Sake, the link on the bottom, uh, which I'll provide to Kevin, uh, and then put in the code MIT and you'll get 20 bucks off 
your first box of sake in their subscription service. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Todd. And, You're welcome. Uh, thanks again for working out all the details there with the sample box. Of course. So we have for time for some Q and A. Yeah, we we got uh, through quite a few questions there. So um, now we're going to move to the breakout rooms, folks. If you are not staying on for the breakout, it was a pleasure having you. I hope you do consider staying. We'll go to the breakouts for about 15 minutes, and we'll come back around 9:03, and then we'll be able to unmute and talk to Todd in kind of a very informal large group setting. So I'm going to go ahead and initiate the breakouts, and we'll see you again in 15 minutes. <laughs>